Welcome everybody to uh, the second day of the CIRM 2020 grantee meeting. This is the morning session and the title of the session is COVID-19 Basic Science and Discovery. Um, before we launch into the talks, I, I, I think it's very interesting to recognize that um, the stem cell field in general and CIRM in particular has taken on a challenge that many may not have thought would have been in our purview, uh, such a terrible public health emergency. But I, I think it speaks to both the zeal and creativity and the breadth of the stem cell field that we actually do have something to offer and, and probably something to offer in a way that many people don't think of the stem cell field as being relevant. And that's that, um, this is a situation where stem cells are used to understand a disease. And maybe it's not the stem cells that go into the patient, but the drugs and devices that are discovered via the stem cells that go into the patients. And I think we're gonna be talking a lot uh, over the next hour or so about the potential of discovering drugs and devices that can help mitigate this terrible disease and the stem cell field and CIRM are right there on the forefront, I think, as you'll see. Uh, the speakers will be uh, Bridget Gompertz, Sandra Leibel, Justin Achita, and Karen Christman. And uh, we'll have a, a panel discussion at the end of the, of, uh, the presentations. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share some of our work on lung stem cells and how we're using them to study the effects of cigarette smoking on COVID-19. I'm a physician scientist at UCLA and my lab has been studying lung repair and regeneration from lung stem cells for many years. But when the COVID-19 pandemic hit in March, we decided to repurpose a lot of our lung stem cell models to study the virus. And so today I'm really happy to share with you some of the work that we've been doing on looking at the direct effects of cigarette smoke on COVID-19. So the lungs are complex and really vital organs. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about their structure and function and why some of the cells are so important in the airway. The upper part of the airway, which goes all the way from the nose down through the trachea and bronchi, is directly in contact with the environment. And so it plays a very important role in defending the body. And this is through this process of mucociliary clearance that we'll talk a lot more about today. The other part of the lungs that's important to note is the very lowest part of the lungs, which are these air sacs. And this is where gas exchange occurs, where oxygen enters our body and carbon dioxide leaves our body. And it's important to also note that the virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19, can be involved and can affect any part of the airway, all the way from the nose down to the distal air sacs. And we're studying all of these different regions in the lab in different ways. But today, what I want to share with you is some of the work that we've been doing on these upper airways here. So mucociliary clearance is really vital in defending the body. And the way that this works is that we have this very highly specialized lining of our upper airways. And one of the specialized cells is called a goblet cell or a mucus producing cell that makes mucus that we're all familiar with. And this mucus is very important because it traps viruses, bacteria, pollution, any kinds of toxins that we may be breathing in. And then there are these other highly specialized cells called ciliated cells which have these tiny hair-like projections on the top. And these hair-like cells beat unidirectionally, and they beat to allow this mucus to be moved up and out of the body where it can be coughed up or, or swallowed. And in that way, um, the effects of these harmful particles is abrogated. And so there's one other really important cell type within this um, lining layer of the airways, which is called a basal cell. And this is really a true adult stem cell in the airway because it's capable of replicating and making more of itself. And it's also capable of making more cells, these differentiated cells, including these goblet mucus cells and these ciliated cells. And the way that this works is shown in this movie where these cilia beat unidirectionally and they're moving these particles up and out of the body and in that way um, preventing infection or other kinds of harmful things to happen. 
So we're fortunate that we have had for many years now a really good um, system where we can actually grow uh, these airway cells in the lab and we can have all of these features of this mucociliary airway. And again, I'm showing you a schematic here with these basal stem cells, the goblet mucus cells, the ciliated cells, and club cells, which also contribute to mucus. And I'm showing you where they look in the actual um, tissue. Um, this is actual tissue from a patient showing you what the lining um, epithelium of these upper airways looks like. And we're able in the lab to get these patient samples, and we are able to digest and strip away this upper lining of cells and then we can digest this upper lining into single cells. And when we do that, all of these differentiated cells will die, but these airway basal stem cells will persist. And then we're able to put them into this culture system, which essentially is what we call a transwell culture system. And that just means that we put these stem cells onto this membrane, which has got very, very tiny pores that will allow all the nutrients to come through, but won't allow the cells to crawl out. And then we grow them in this liquid, which, as I said, which has got all these nutrients, which is called media. And these are primary human bronchial epithelial cells, or HBECs, that are grown on this transwell membrane. And over a period of about five days, they divide, they proliferate, and eventually they form this very, very tight layer of cells on the bottom here, resting on the transwell. And then what we're able to do at that point is to actually remove the liquid media from the surface of the cultures and just have the media in the bottom of the cultures. And in this way, we create this air-liquid interface. And this provides the cue to allow these stem cells to go on and differentiate and make these mucous cells and ciliated cells. So this is a lovely system for us to study a large number of different processes um, in the lab. And the way that this looks is that we can actually go in and use fluorescent markers to stain um, particular kinds of cell types. So here in green, I'm showing you the ciliated cells. And then in red are the mucous cells. And then in white are the stem cells, these airway basal stem cells. And I want to mention that this work is being done by a really talented group of scientists in my lab, Arunima Perkayastha, Chandani Sen, and Abdo Dara. And so what we are able to do now is to take these air liquid interface cultures and we can expose them directly to cigarette smoke. And we have this very cool setup in the lab, which is really this airtight chamber. And we put the cells inside the chamber, inside their culture plate, and then we seal everything off. Uh, we light one of these research grade cigarettes. And then through a series of vacuum pumps, we're able to draw the cigarette smoke into the chamber, directly exposing the cells. And then we have a separate vacuum pump that will then draw the cigarette smoke out of the chamber. And in this way, we're able to replicate what smoking really looks like when people puff on a cigarette. And so this is the schematic of how we seed the stem cells. Um, then once they're confluent and um, the cultures look good, we take them to the air liquid interface. We allow the mucus and ciliated cells to differentiate over about 19 days. And then we expose once a day um, to smoking for about three minutes for four days. And then on the day after the smoking exposures, we add the live virus. And this is through a collaboration with Vaiti Arumagaswamy here at UCLA. Um, after three days, he deactivates the virus. And of course, all of this viral infection is done in our high containment BSL-3 conditions. So under very, very strict um, conditions. And then after the virus is deactivated, we're able to get these cultures back so that we can analyze them and, and, and look at the effects of smoking on the airway. And so this is an example of what um, the cultures look like. And um, here I'm showing you in green, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And in blue is the DAPI, which is staining the nuclei of the cells. And the first um, culture here on the left is showing you where there's no cigarette smoke and just the virus. And I hope you can appreciate in green, you can see a cluster of cells that's been infected by the virus. And then on the right panel here, I'm showing you where cigarette smoke exposure was done before viral exposure. 
And here we see, um, and we've done this many times, and we consistently see that there's many more clusters of cells and the clusters tend to be larger. So we see a lot more infected cells if the cultures are exposed first to cigarette smoke. And this is also shown here on the right uh, with a viral load PCR reaction, which was done by Gustavo Garcia. And um, what we appreciate is that there is a lot more virus around um, when um, there is cigarette smoke exposure first. And so we then decided to look at the different kinds of cell types with each of these different exposure conditions to um, get a sense of what the virus is doing to the different cell types uh, and what cigarette smoke is doing to the different cell types. And so on the left uh, most panel, we have here no cigarette smoke, no virus. And this is, this is just a baseline in the eloquent interface cultures, what the ciliated cells look like. And they're shown here in white. And then you can appreciate, I'm sure, that when we add cigarette smoke but no virus, we get a loss of, this, of the ciliated cells. But what was really interesting to us is that in the setting of viral infection um, with no cigarette smoke exposure, we don't see a loss of ciliated cells. The virus doesn't seem to be harming the ciliated cells and, and they are still present. And then in the setting where there's cigarette smoke and virus, we see a loss of ciliated cells, but this wasn't statistically significant. Now, when we have um, the, the situation of looking at the mucus cells, this is the baseline number of mucus cells that we typically see when there's no cigarette smoke and no virus. Here, when we see cigarette smoke, we see a lot of induction of mucus. And of course, this is probably no surprise to anybody because we know that cigarette smoke will induce mucus. In the setting of no cigarette smoke with virus, we see that there's really not a large increase in the number of mucus cells, uh, maybe a slight increase, but not, not, not statistically significant. And again, we did not see a statistically significant increase when there was cigarette smoke and virus. So given these interesting effects of the virus on the different cell types, we decided to look at the, at the basal stem cells. And we look at this in two ways. One, with a marker of stem cells, which is KRT5 or keratin-5. And here we see that with cigarette smoke, there is actually a large increase in the number of basal stem cells um, in the ALI cultures. And this is because the um, cigarette smoke is perceived by the cells as an injury. And so they respond to injury by dividing and making more stem cells. However, the virus alone without cigarette smoke does not induce that same proliferation of the stem cells. And we see a little bit more proliferation with cigarette smoke, but not a lot in the setting of viral infection. And then uh, we're also um, looking in another way at the stem cells by looking at the dividing and proliferating stem cells, which is shown here by these pink dots in the nucleus. And here we see that with cigarette smoke, we see a lot more of these dividing cells. But in viral infection, we don't see that the stem cells are dividing. And in the setting of cigarette smoke plus um, the virus, we saw sort of an in-between phenotype. And so the virus seems to be doing something very interesting in these air liquid interface cultures in that there doesn't seem to be much in the way of an injury being perceived. And so we decided to look at the single cell level by using single cell RNA sequencing at exactly what might, what might be going on within the cultures. And so this is a work done in collaboration with Catherine Plath and Justin Langerman. And what we noted in these red boxes is that the number of viral transcripts, the gene expression within the cells is markedly reduced when virus is um, introduced into the cultures, whereas smoking um, seems to have very little effect on the number of transcripts. And looking at this in a different way, we looked at these heat maps and really what these do is show us patterns of gene expression across these four different groups and where the gene expression goes up or down. And the prevailing pattern that we saw was that in the setting of um, virus infection, either with or without cigarette smoke, it looked very similar, um, but that we see that most of the genes are down-regulated in expression, whether there's no cigarette smoke or there is cigarette smoke. Although, of course, other patterns exist, for example, we do see that some genes are increased in the setting of viral infection. And this particular group over here was very interesting to us. This is genes that are increased in expression in the setting of just viral infection, but are decreased when there's viral infection with smoking. And what was really interesting to us is that in this particular group, we found that the interferon response genes, which are very important in immune function um, within the airway epithelium, that they were decreased in the setting of cigarette smoke. 
And this implied to us that cigarette smoke reduces the interferon response. And therefore, this may be at least one of the mechanisms whereby the virus is able to get into the cells and why we see so many more infected cells in the setting of cigarette smoke. And so to look at this further, we performed another experiment. And this time what we did is to think about adding interferon beta to the cultures in comparison to remdesivir, which is used clinically um, and, and has a response in patients to see whether interferon beta uh, might have an effect on the cultures, especially in the setting of cigarette smoke exposure. And so here's the data, and I hope you can appreciate this first column uh, is no drug, I'm just showing you the viral infection and how much more there is with cigarette smoke. In, with interferon beta-1, we found a complete abrogation of infection. So we completed, completely prevented infection, even in the setting of cigarette smoke. And with remdesivir, um, we saw a good effect as well, although there was slightly more infection than what we saw with interferon beta. And this is quantified by these graphs. So in summary, um, what I've shown today is that we really believe that cigarette smoke has a, has a large impact on the airways and that at least acute cigarette smoke exposure um, makes people more at risk uh, for having more, um, more virally infected cells and therefore we believe more severe viral infection. And so I really want to acknowledge my wonderful lab who, despite the pandemic, um, have worked really hard to generate what we think is very important data. And I also want to acknowledge Vaiti Ramagaswamy, without whom we would not be able to do the viral infections. And Gus Garcia, who's a very talented technician in his lab, has also been instrumental in all of this work. And I want, also want to acknowledge Catherine Plath, Justin Langerman, and the UCLA Molecular Shared Screening Resource, and Robert Damaso for all their work. And I also want to um, thank CIRM very much for their funding, because without this funding, we would really not be able to do any of this COVID-19 work. And um, we're hoping that this will lead to greater understanding of the disease and also ultimately, hopefully, to a therapy. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. I would like to thank CERM for the opportunity to speak and share uh, the research that we'll be presenting and that we got funding for. Um, we will be studying the diversity of COVID-19 lung disease and variable treatment options in a uh, diverse population of stem cell induced lung tissue organoids. COVID-19 disproportionately affects people of color and minority groups. There is ample evidence uh, clinically in the hospital system as well as the rates of infection. Black, indigenous, and people of color experience more severe symptoms and complications from COVID-19, which is caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2. This is seen in hospitalizations and specifically in the lung disease, acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. There have been large clinical treatment trials that aim to treat this disease in the hospital, but these treatment trials have mainly been done in uh, large academic centers and lack diversity. There's been two remdesivir trials, and one had only included 20% people of color, while the other one actually included even less so. And therefore, these trials really target only one isolated population of uh, people and therefore we don't really know whether it has the same effects on um, uh, various uh, races, ethnicities, as well as genders. In order to be able to replicate not only the infection of SARS-CoV-2 in a lung tissue organoid system, we can utilize human lung in vitro model systems in order to study the effects of the infection, not only on epithelial lung tissue, but also on the endothelial cells and the immune cells inherent within the lung tissue. But not only that, if we have a human lung in vitro model system, we can also choose various genders, ethnicities, as well as HLA types to then be able to determine uh, the effects of the infection and then hopefully utilize repurposed drugs in the setting of those different genders, ethnicities, and HLA types. We aim to utilize induced pluripotent stem cell derived 3D lung tissue organoids to represent a patient specific platform. So here we have a schematic that shows what we aim to do um, for our grant for the next year. There are uh, multiple published lung differentiation protocols that we're utilizing as well as our own. 
And what the workflow is, is isolating somatic cells from populations um, of various genders and diverse ethnicities, uh, cultivate them in a dish, add reprogramming factors to then reprogram them into fully functional induced pluripotent stem cells, and then add small molecules and growth factors to push the pluripotent stem cells into three-dimensional lung organoids, endothelial cells, and immune cells. And then finally, using these co-cultured lung tissue in vitro um, models, we can then push them through a high-throughput mechanism to determine drug treatment options. So this is a schematic of our directed differentiation into multicellular 3D lung organoids. So these are just the isolated 3D lung organoids. We start with our stem cell population and then push them towards an endodermal germ layer, going through the definitive endoderm, anterior foregut endoderm, and the lung progenitor or ventralized anterior foregut endoderm. And this is all done in a monolayer. And then finally, we push them into actual lung organoids by passaging them into 3D transwell with matrigel in them. What we're also able to do, and that's very innovative and novel, is actually direct the differentiation of these lung organoids into three different populations. We can add variable small molecules and growth factors to push them into a more upper airway or a proximal lung phenotype, a more parenchymal or alveolar distal lung phenotype, or a combination of both and represent an entire whole lung phenotype. And these are schemata of um, different um, a phase contrast images of the various uh, lung tissue cells that we can make. Here we show a bright field of the proximal lung organoids that we can derive. Here is a uh, schemata of uh, an NKX2-1 GFP receptor phenotype, which uh, indicates a more distal alveolar type. And here we have, actually have a video of the whole lung um, 24 hours after the addition of a DCI cocktail or dexamethasone cyclic AMP and isobutylxanthine, which actually causes these branching organoids to start to fully mature and become more of these um, sphere-like organoids. Uh, what we are also aiming to do is to co-culture these lung organoids with isogenic pluripotent stem cell-derived endothelial and macrophage cells. Here in the Snyder lab, uh, they've already devised a, a routine protocol that um, targets iPSCs into CD31 and lectin expressing uh, vascular three-dimensional endothelial cells. And with a collaborator at SBP, we are also able to differentiate iPSCs into macrophages and co-culture them with the lung organoids, here seen in red. Finally, um, after we have derived these isogenic lung tissue organoids, we aim to utilize high throughput drug screening to assess um, cytotoxicity from SARS-CoV-2 infection. And this is done in collaboration with Dr. Sumachanda, who has published a screen of over 12,000 late stage, clinical stage, or FDA approved drugs, or his reframe study. Um, his primary screen actually utilized immortalized cell lines and not only human ones, but also uh, kidney monkey ones. And therefore, we aim to uh, utilize a more clinically relevant human lung system in order to fast track promising drugs to patients. And these will not only incorporate um, epithelial and mesenchymal um, cell populations, which we have in our lung organoids, but also incorporate the endothelial and immune populations as well. And finally, as I introduced in the background, these must include a diversity of genders and ethnicities in order to truly understand the effects of not only SARS-CoV-2 on lung tissue, but also the effects of the different therapeutic options that we will be trialing. So this is our project timeline in a Gantt chart. And uh, just to split it up quickly and then go into more detail, um, we're gonna utilize, uh, we're initially gonna differentiate the iPSCs into lungs, macrophages, and vasculature, characterize them. Then we're going to get baseline molecular characterization using single cell RNA-seq and cytokine proteomics. Finally, we're going to infect them with both the SARS-CoV-2 pseudotype spike and the authentic live virus. And then we'll determine the efficacy of two uh, protease inhibitors that we have determined may be important in reducing cytotoxicity from these viruses. This is our panel of the various iPSC-derived organoids that we will be utilizing. We will be obtaining male and female iPSCs from Caucasian, African-American, and Latinx populations, as well as the HLA B4601 type in uh, collaboration with Dr. Maria Bettinotti. 
So milestone one, we have obtained the iPSCs from the table that I've just presented. We have been differentiating them into 3D lung organoids, as well as endothelial cells. We're starting to differentiate them into alveolar macrophages, and we are starting to characterize the cell populations. Here's a schematic of our co-culture systems with our lung organoids expressed with cytotracker red and the endothelial cells tagged with cytotracker green. And you could see here that they're co-localizing nicely in a three-dimensional conformation in Matrigel. And they're probably even secreting a little bit of mucus or surfactant, which is kind of nice. Milestone two is to determine the baseline molecular characterization using single cell RNA-seq and proteomics. And we have already done this with our proximal um, lung organoid system. We have performed single cell RNA-seq and um, we will be performing uh, these same types of uh, experiments in collaboration with uh, Dr. Jean Yao and uh, the proteomics with Dr. Carl Ware. Milestone three, we'll be infecting our lung tissue organoids with SARS-CoV-2 pseudotype and authentic virus. Uh, here we show our preliminary data with uh, the pseudotype virus, which also is expressing GFP once it enters the cell and infects. And you can see it infects our organoids in the three-dimensional formation, as well as the monolayer in a lower and higher magnification. And here we show that the virus is targeting goblet cells, uh, which express MUC5AC, and definitely targets the ACE2 receptor. But what's interesting is we're also finding that SARS-CoV-2 pseudotype virus can also infect cells that in fact do not express the ACE2 receptor. And that's why it's important to study medications and compounds that may not actually utilize the Tempris-2 ACE2 receptor um, entrance. Finally, this is our data for uh, infecting our lung organoids with authentic live virus. I do have BSL-3 access and have been infecting the lung organoids with the live virus. Uh, here we see our intact whole lung organoids infect by showing positivity for spike as well as nucleocapsid, as well as our proximal lung organoids, also our positive population. We have determined the most uh, infective MOI. And finally, we've also run some compounds just to show that these uh, lung organoids can in fact be infected and show um, a response to various treatment options. Milestone four will determine the action and efficacy of one of the protease inhibitors, ONO5334. This is a potent non-lysosomotropic inhibitor of cathepsin K protease. Its initial use was in a phase two trial in menopausal women, and it was used in oral doses, which is uh, preferred over IV, and uh, initially utilized for inhibiting osteoporosis. It inhibits viral entry and viral enzymes that destroy connective tissue in the interstitial matrix, and therefore it may actually protect alveolar and bronchial lung epithelium. And here we show our preliminary data using the pseudotyped virus, um, along with treatment with ONO5334, and uh, a negative and a positive control of DMSO and remdesivir and showing that it does actually decrease infectivity. Finally, milestone five will be to assess the action efficacy of another protease inhibitor, VBYH25. This is more of a pan-cathepsin protease inhibitor, and it has been already tested for toxicity and efficacy in multiple preclinical models. And its initial indication for use was for autoimmune disorders, which actually may be effective against the immune and inflammatory responses triggered by SARS-CoV-2, which is why it's important to actually have an immune cell within the modeling system. Finally, milestone six, if everything goes well and according to plan and milestones four and five suggest efficacy, then we can actually schedule an interact or pre-IND meeting for the two um, different molecules. Um, and we're already in uh, co collaborating with IQVIA in order to make sure that this process is seamless. And then hopefully um, our work um, and our model system will then be able to lead towards clinical trials utilizing these uh, molecules. So in conclusion, using lung uh, tissue organoid co-cultures to dis study disease disparity from COVID-19 is extremely important and um, also uh, allows um, feasibility and facility by utilizing patient-specific lines, including those of different genders, ethnicities, and HLA types, and utilizing uh, the different cells from the same isogenic uh, pluripotent stem cells, which retains that population's genetics as well as epigenetics. Um, we can also mimic the human organ in a dish, and instead of awaiting uh, lung biopsies from donors, we can have an infinite supply that we can continue to differentiate 
passage as well as cryopreserve. And here again is our panel of the iPSC-derived organoids that we will be differentiating and uh, co-culturing. Finally, if uh, genetics is not uh, the reason for disparity and it's more of an environmental or epigenetic phenomenon, we can actually expose these lung tissue uh, organoids to either nicotine or vaping. And that's in collaboration with our um, uh, with a lab that studies lung cancer in the setting of uh, smoking and tobacco. And we can actually study various environmental factors to determine if they are the cause for worse outcomes. And finally, the use for drug screening in our lung organoid model is great because you can actually avoid the animal model. As we know, all know that there are multiple drugs that may be efficacious in animals, but then ultimately fail in large human clinical trials. We can directly test human cells for effect, and human cells are um, important because they're the ones that express the different receptors and entry points for the virus that may not actually be utilizing specific receptors that uh, animals may not have. And finally, patient-specific treatment regimes, as we've talked about before. So I just want to acknowledge Dr. Evan Snyder, who's the PI on this grant, as well as um, of the grad students, postdocs, and uh, research assistants in the lab who are helping with all the differentiation and uh, infections, as well as all of our collaborators, and of course, the funding from CIRM. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, my name is Justin Ichida. I'm an associate professor uh, in the Department of Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine at USC. I'm going to tell you about a new program that we have uh, trying to develop a drug for coronavirus infection. I think, you know, probably like a lot of uh, scientists, we were not working on viral uh, drugs or biology at all um, when the pandemic hit, but we found something that was, you know, that we were working on that was extremely relevant, I think, to uh, uh, COVID-19. And I'll tell you about that today. Uh, so, you know, what we're primarily doing in my lab at USC is to, uh, to make new therapeutics or drugs for Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS. Our approach is very stem cell based. So we generally um, use uh, patient blood to create stem cells in a, in a Petri dish, which we can then coax to become any cell in the body. And for us, we, we coax them to become the types of nerve cells that are lost in ALS patients. Uh, these cells are called motor nerve cells. Uh, and what's remarkable about, uh, remarkable about these cells is that uh, once you create them from ALS patients, they actually mimic the disease in a dish. So you can see them degenerate over time uh, faster than those from healthy controls. And uh, that allows you to search for new drugs that might help ALS patients by screening through all of the drugs that are available and finding the ones that best you know, rescue the survival of those ALS patient nerve cells in a dish. And so that's one of the projects that we've really been doing in the lab over the past several years. And when we did that project, one of the, the major findings we had was that we found that uh, blocking the activity of a specific enzyme in the cell called PIK5 uh, was one of the most effective ways at preventing ALS patients' nerve cell death. And you can see that in this picture here. Um, all of these white cells are motor nerve cells from an ALS patient. You can see with placebo, there was really no effect. Uh, there was really a, a large loss of the, of the cells. Um, but with this drug called the PIK5 inhibitor, uh, you can see that we preserved many of these. Now, uh, one thing that's important is that the known or existing PIK5 inhibitor uh, chemicals uh, that, are, that are out there today, um, none of them are really suitable for using in humans. The reason is because they're very unstable in the body. Uh, they don't last long enough to really elicit the therapeutic benefit. Um, so we had been working in our lab and with a, a startup company called Acurastem to make a new PIK5 inhibitor that can last for a long time in the body and therefore 
um, you know, block the activity of PIK5 in, in humans for, for the treatment of ALS. Now, what happened was once the pandemic hit, um, uh, people had a, you know, really scrambled to find uh, if there were any types of known chemicals that could block coronavirus infection. And so uh, some of the folks down in San Diego did a, a screen uh, and they tested all known chemicals, including the FDA approved drugs, um, all known chemicals that had ever been tested at some point in humans. There are 12,000 of these. And they looked for things that uh, blocked coronavirus infection in cells in a dish. And what they found was that the same type of chemical that we had found to be effective at rescuing ALS motor nerve cells was also the most potent way to block uh, coronavirus infection. And this is their result. Um, and basically all you need to know is that each of these boxes represents one experiment. And as you go from left to right, uh, they're increasing the amount of these different drugs that you have on the right here. And as you go, as you increase in concentration, when you get to the yellow boxes, that means the virus is being blocked from infecting the cells. And you can see that this PIK5 inhibitor, Apilomod, blocks the the cells from being infected much earlier at much lower concentrations than any of the other chemicals, including the one drug here, remdesivir, that is already approved for, has been shown to clinically uh, reduce uh, coronavirus infection. So this type of drug, this PIK5 inhibitor, is about 20 or 30 times better at blocking viral infection than the, the drugs that we have today. And so we thought that, wow, we should really test our new PIK5 inhibitors that we're making that can now survive for a long time in human in the body uh, for the ability to block coronavirus infection, and we should move this towards the clinic. And so that's the project that CIRM uh, funded uh, for us to do. And so why, the question is, why does it block infection? Um, and, and this cartoon can help to illustrate that. So this is just a picture of a cell that's been kind of chopped in half. Uh, you're sort of looking at a cross section of the cell. Um, and what you'll see is that um, the, the, the virus can enter cells in two different ways. And I'm going to concentrate primarily today on this late pathway. And there's also an early pathway, which I'll briefly mention. So the late pathway this virus comes along to the surface of the cell, it binds to a specific protein on the cell, and then it gets engulfed into the cell, but it remains in this lipid, this um, membrane enclosed vesicle where it's trapped. And it actually can't get out of this uh, and start replicating within the cell unless um, something happens. So what happens is that enzyme that I talked about, PIK5, it helps to get this vesicle to fuse with another type of membrane enclosed vesicle called a lysosome. When that happens, some of the proteins in the lysosome can actually activate this um, virus to be able to crawl out of that vesicle. And when it does that, now the virus gets released into the rest of the host cell and it can replicate and amplify. So if you block PIK5 activity, this virus remains trapped in these vesicles and never can replicate and, and really fully infect the cell. And so that's how we're blocking uh, the infection. Um, what makes the virus, the coronavirus tricky is that it has a second way of infecting cells called the early pathway. And so in reality, I think we'll need to block both of these pathways to really completely block the infection um, of the virus. But today we're working on um, this late pathway. So, as I mentioned before, um, the existing, the best exi existing PIK5 uh, inhibitors, they're chemicals that are similar to drugs, but they're not really fully drugs. And the reason is because, uh, as you can see, one example of that type of molecule, this it's called a pilamod in the blue line, you can see that when it goes into a, the body, uh, it drops to below effective concentrations within just a couple of hours. So as you can imagine, that's not very effective at blocking infection. Um, but the new inhibitors that we've made um, have a substantially longer 
lifetime in the body. And so we believe that they could actually be effective against the coronavirus infection. So one of the drug candidates that we've made called ASR149, we've tested it now um, in the CERN project. We've tested it to see if it can um, actually inhibit uh, the PIK5 enzyme in the body. Uh, we, we've tested this first in mice here. Um, these are just a cross-section of lung tissue um, from mice. And everywhere where you see these green spots uh, here, these are evidence that the drug ASR149 is actually inhibiting PIK5 in these lung cells. And so what you notice is that with ASR149, you see a lot more of the green spots, which really indicates that it's getting into the lung where the, where the coronavirus would normally infect and it's blocking the PIK5 activity in those lung cells. So that is very promising uh, for the ability of it to hopefully block coronavirus infection in people. What we've done besides that is go into now making sure that our new PIK5 inhibitor called ASR149 uh, still inhibits PIK5 with high uh, efficiency. And so we, this is an example of that where we have um, a slightly weakened version of the coronavirus that doesn't replicate uh, in, and so we can use it safely in our lab at USC. And then we would um, compare its ability to, uh, we compared the ability of that coronavirus to infect cells. Um, if we had, um, you know, either a, a placebo control, which is called DMSO here, or our ASR149, you can see that ASR149 severely blocked infection of the cells. Remdesivir did not block infection in this case, and we didn't expect it to because although it works in in humans, uh, it works by blocking the, the viral replication process. And since these are replication defective coronaviruses, uh, we're just looking at one, a single infection of cells. And so we're not looking at replication at all. So we didn't expect remdesivir to work and it definitely didn't. Uh, but the bottom line is that um, ASR149 was very effective here. So then we took it one step further and we, we tested it against real live replicating coronavirus. And this had to be done at a special facility um, in Utah. And what they found is that um, they're looking at, in this case, they're looking at the ability of coronavirus to block infection. And so the higher you go on this Y axis means there's more blockage against the virus. Uh, and you can see that as we went higher in the dose of 149, we got to a point where we limited, we blocked infection by 100%. Um, and this was about 100 or 200 times more, uh, less we needed about 200 times less drug uh, than the amount that actually starts showing toxicity to the cells themselves. And so this is a very nice therapeutic you know, window where we don't, we don't cause any toxicity in the area where we're, where we're really already blocking the virus. Um, and so this means that our drug, uh, if it's delivered to the cells at the right concentration, will definitely block the coronavirus infection. Um, so what we're doing now is taking this one step further where we've worked with our colleague at USC. Uh, she's another professor, her name is Yawen Chen. And uh, she's a stem cell expert of a different sort. Um, Remember that as we used stem cells made from patients' blood to make motor nerve cells, uh, she specializes in making um, lung tissue from these stem cells. And so what she's made are these uh, miniature lungs in a dish. Um, and she's shown that if she makes a coronavirus that um, encodes a, a little protein that, that makes the, the resulting infected cells green, uh, you can see that it infects these cells all along here and makes them bright green. And so now what we can do is test to make sure that the drug blocks uh, coronavirus infection in, in, in miniature lungs uh, from, from humans. And we can determine if, it, if there's any variability between different types of, pe of people uh, and, and the ability of this drug to block infection into their lung cells. And coincident with that, we're also testing this in, in some small animal models like the hamster who, the hamsters get infected very well by the coronavirus. And so we can make sure that the drug blocks the ability of the coronavirus to infect the hamster cell, uh, the hamsters. Uh, and once that, if that looks good, we will be moving quickly towards um, clinical trials. 
So uh, in, in conclusion, um, the key points are that, you know, the coronavirus enters cells through both an early and a late pathway and blocking an enzyme called PIK5 is, is one of the most potent ways of blocking the late pathway. And so we've, uh, unfortunately, the drugs that are, ex uh, the, the, the chemicals that are existing for PIK5, blocking PIK5 are not good drugs. So we developed a new PIK5 inhibitor. Uh, although we were planning to use it for ALS patients, um, we are now trying to see if we should repurpose it uh, for blocking the coronavirus infections. Uh, treating COVID-19 patients. And what we know so far is that it, uh, like some of its predecessor chemicals, it potently blocks coronavirus infection in the dish. So we've preserved the antiviral activity and we've given it a better longevity in, in the body. And uh, so we think it's a drug that uh, could work quite well. Uh, so in conclusion, I'd just like to thank uh, the people in my lab who've contributed to this work. Um, Yi Chen and Manuel have have been the major contributors in my lab. Uh, Monica Zhou and Wen Chuan Chang have been key uh, contributors from Akiristem. And our collaborator at USC, Yao Wen Chen, ha has now provided us these uh, miniature lungs in a dish uh, for us to test the efficacy. And the majority of this work has been uh, supported by CIRM, as well as some of our other uh, funding agencies. So thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about some of my lab's work on developing pro-healing uh, biomaterials to treat uh, inflamed tissues and, and inflammation across the body. Of course, this is a COVID session, um, but we're just starting to work on COVID. So I'll give you a little bit of the background of how we um, develop these therapies and how now we're trying to, to tackle COVID-19 related inflammation. Uh, so um, obviously with CIRM, uh, everybody is typically focused on stem cells um, and cells which make up obviously the major component of our tissues, uh, but our tissues are not just made up of cells. They're also made up of an extracellular matrix, which is consists of this uh, fibrous architecture that the cell sits in um, and is bound to. It's what gives our tissue structure, uh, but it's not just a physical structure. It actually provides very important cues uh, to cells in every tissue of the body. Um, and it provides cues for pretty much all aspects of cell behavior. So this can be cell survival, differentiation, division, um, or even migration. And so it's really important when thinking about trying to heal damaged tissue uh, that we not only think about just the cell component, but also this extracellular matrix component. Uh, and so this is something that we think about a lot um, and as a biomaterials lab. And so we try to design materials that can mimic or replace the extracellular matrix and promote endogenous healing. Uh, and so one other thing I'd like to point out about the extracellular matrix is it's actually it's quite specific um, to each tissue. So there's cardiac extracellular matrix is different than say your lung extracellular matrix. Um, and this uh, picture down here is actually of a cardiac extracellular matrix where all the cells have been stripped out. And so you can see it has this kind of fibrous architecture and this is what the cells uh, see and sit inside. So to design a biomaterial to replace in a diseased tissue or an inflamed tissue um, what is typically damaged extracellular matrix and to try to replace it with a more normal extracellular matrix that will recruit stem cells and promote healing, um, we've designed a number of injectable biomaterials, which we call extracellular matrix hydrogels. They're actually designed from what nature has given us um, in the first place, which is the extracellular matrix in our tissues. So we take actually our starting materials from pigs um, um, so um, we take, in this case, image here is porcine muscle. So it's actually the loin, um, for those of you who cook. Uh, so it's porcine loin that we chop into small pieces. Uh, we decellularize it, or we remove all of the cells, leaving behind just the extracellular matrix. We then lyophilize it, which means freeze dry it, and mill it into a fine powder, and then use an enzyme to uh, digest it and make it into a liquid. And what's really interesting is that when you take this liquid, 
liquid and you put it back into the body, you inject it back into, say, a diseased tissue, it forms this porous and fibrous scaffold, um, very similar to the original extracellular matrix. So this inset here is actually this stage here where you just have isolated extracellular matrix, but before we've done the processing. And you can see the, the architecture in terms of the pores and fibers is actually quite similar. And then if you look at our extracellular matrix hydrogels under an electron microscope, you see it has this nice nanofibrous architecture, which is the same size scale as the native extracellular matrix. So we've made these um, extracellular matrix hydrogels from porcine skeletal muscle, also porcine uh, cardiac tissue. Since in my lab, our, one of our main um, focuses is on treating the heart after a heart attack and also treating skeletal muscle in the case of peripheral artery disease where it has low blood flow uh, is particularly to your to your legs but you can create you can generally do this similar type of process to create uh, ECM or extracellular matrix hydrogels from all different kinds of tissue so um, just to give you a little bit better idea of how you um, make these tissues. This is just a short video of one of my former grad students uh, kind of just going quickly through that process. Hi, my name is Jean Wang and I'm a first year MD-PhD student in the Chrisman lab and this is how we make our therapy for treating heart attacks. So we get heart tissue and the first step is we chop it up into tiny pieces and we put it into a bath like a beaker right here and stir it up with uh, detergent so that to remove all the cellular contents. After a couple days, uh, we rinse it out to remove all the detergents and all we really have left are the structural proteins that make up a tissue. So we take that and we freeze dry it into this styrofoam like substance. It's really light and crispy. Uh, so it's freeze dried and then we take this and we mill it into a fine powder that looks like this. Um, we take that and digest it with uh, an enzyme to liquefy it. And you can see that there's liquid at the bottom of this and this little bead is just stirring it up and keeping everything well mixed. And then finally, we take the liquid form of this and we inject it into the heart, into damaged heart tissue. And once the liquid hits body temperature, it forms a gel that looks like this and it no longer flows anymore. So that gives you hopefully a good visual on what these kind of materials look like. It's actually a, quite a simple process to, to make them. Um, and we've shown the potential for endogenous, meaning repairing, having the body repair itself and recruiting stem cells uh, in a variety of different types of preclinical models. So we've shown in a heart attack model, this is a, actually a pig model, um, in blue is our cardiac extracellular matrix hydrogel um, injected two weeks after a heart attack attack and going out to three months, so significant improvements in cardiac function. We've also tested in a rat uh, peripheral artery disease model, our skeletal muscle, as well as a couple other extracellular matrix hydrogels. Um, and you can see here in green and blue are two ECM hydrogels that we've tested. Um, and this is showing increased perfusion, which is increased blood flow compared to a saline control, suggesting that you can create uh, increased blood flow, which would help with peripheral artery disease. And then we've also found in the case of our skeletal muscle material that you get increases in skeletal muscle stem cells, which are these PAC7 positive stem cells. Um, so overall, we've seen a lot of success with endogenous tissue repair with our extracellular matrix hydrogels. And across the board, we've really found that they're pro-survival, meaning they prevent further cell death and tissue damage. They recruit stem cells. And then importantly, especially in talking about in a minute here about COVID-19, is that they're immunomodulatory, meaning they influence the immune response. And instead of having a pro-inflammatory response, it shifts it to a pro-modeling and healing one. Also importantly, um, the potential to move this into the clinic is there. So a company I co-founded, Ventrix, did a phase one clinical trial with the cardiac material in heart attack patients showing initial safety. Um, so uh, this is still undergoing clinical development, but I think these early results are great for proving that you could use this safely in other uh, potential disease indications. 
So we've now developed a new version of our extracellular matrix that we call a soluble extracellular matrix to enable a different form of delivery. What I just showed you, those materials were injected directly into the tissue, either the heart or skeletal muscle, but we wanted something that could be delivered through the vasculature to tissues that are diseased or, or have inflammation. And so we go through the same process that we just, just showed you and through the video up to D here. And then what we do is we fractionate it and remove these insoluble components and leave behind just the soluble um, component that can be re-dried, um, rehydrated with sterile water prior to injection. If you inject it just under the skin, it will form a gel. But when you deliver it intravascularly, meaning inject into the bloodstream, it will actually target and gel um, at the areas of inflamed tissue. So here's an example of a rat heart that has been given a heart attack, and our material was fluorescently labeled. And so you can see it is actually retained at the infarct or the region of heart attack. Uh, and then if you look at a with a microscope at tissue sections, you see the material actually gels and fills in the gap. So this is the material here is in red of le leaky vasculature. So in, in areas of inflammation, you, the endothelial cells that line our blood vessels actually become leaky. And it appears that the material will seal off um, this leaky vasculature. And in fact, in the heart attack model, we've studied extensively showing that it reduces vascular leakage. It's pro um, remodeling, it's immunomodulatory. Um, and actually found that it was pro-survival. So because of all of those effects, we thought that this has significant potential to treat uh, other diseases with inflammation like COVID-19. Um, so what we've done so far is we've tested a couple different animal models of lung inflammation. So um, lung inflammation is not the only issue with COVID-19, but it's obviously one of the major issues um, that uh, people die from is excessive uh, inflammation. And so we've tested two models so far. The one I'm showing you here is an acid model where you deliver acid to the lungs um, in a rodent model to create inflammation. And then we delivered our soluble extracellular matrix just via the IV delivery, so intravenous injection. And we fluorescently tag the material again, and you can see it lights up the lungs. If you deliver just saline, you see no signal. And if you deliver the soluble extracellular matrix in a healthy animal, you see nothing. So it really only targets targets the areas of, of inflammation. And then this is in a second model of uh, actually both lung inflammation and systemic inflammation. So it's a little bit better uh, model for COVID-19. It's where you inject uh, what's called a lipopolysaccharide. It's made from bacteria. You inject it into the bloodstream and it causes systemic or basically inflammation across the body, but particularly in the lungs. Again, if you take just healthy animal, inject a soluble extracellular matrix, you see no retention, um, but in this LPS model, so area of inflammation, you again see um, major retention of the soluble material in the lungs. And we actually saw it in some of the other um, inflamed organs as well. So now uh, with CIRM funding, we are testing to see if this is in fact immunomodulatory and we'll kind of put a halt on inflammation and ideally create a pro-remodeling response that would lead to lung healing. Um, and eventually we'll examine um, other organs too, but Right now, our focus is really on uh, the lungs to try to dampen that um, overactive lung inflammation that's leading to, to death in many of the COVID-19 patients. So to briefly summarize, um, I've shown you hopefully, or at least briefly, that extracellular matrix hydrogels are a great technology for promoting endogenous or the body's own tissue repair. We now have this new soluble extracellular matrix form that can treat inflamed tissue via the vasculature, which makes it really great for delivery, just a simple intravenous injection, so very minimally invasive. Um, and based on all the results we've seen with the extracellular matrix hydrogels and the soluble extracellular matrix and these other model models showing um, that they're immunomodulatory and recruit stem cells. We think this really has significant potential to treat the overactive lung inflammation as well as other organ inflammation and tissue damage related to, to COVID-19. And with that, just briefly, I'd like to thank um, all my current and former members who contributed with the development of uh, these biomaterial technologies, um, and of course, funding, particularly uh, CIRM, who's uh, funding our work uh, for ECM hydrogels for peripheral artery disease, and now for um, trying to, to translate this to COVID-19 patients. So thank you very much. Those were spectacular talks, and uh, I think what is really striking is 
how many recurring themes there are across, uh, across the talks, uh, dealing with viral entry and different ways of blocking it, uh, uh, trying to attack inflammation either through biomaterials or through particular anti-inflammatory drugs, looking at environmental uh, perturbations in addition to whatever uh, genetic uh, or, or cellular predispositions could exist, and then just the, uh, the common use of stem cell-based uh, models like organoids. So I, I think probably in the discussion we'll get into a little bit more of the more global themes, but I did want to uh, address certain specific questions that have come, uh, have come to us. Uh, the first question is to Bridget, and uh, the question was uh, whether, and in fact, actually there's three questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll hit you with the three questions that specifically deal with, with your system. One was whether you think that other forms of smoke intoxication, so in other words, vaping or marijuana usage would give you the same effect that you're seeing with uh, nicotine use and smoking, mm -hmm. how that might change uh, the, the uh, ACE2 receptor. Are you seeing changes in ACE2 receptor expression in response to that? And whether you're seeing any gender disparity in terms of uh, the effect of nicotine. Uh, is there a difference in male and females? So, three questions. Then, <laughs> Thanks, yes, I'll take them. Don't overwhelm you. So, first of all, in terms of the vaping question, uh, that's a really great question and something that we're very interested in. Um, in um, so, this is in pre-COVID work from my lab. Uh, we've shown that vaping um, definitely causes injury uh, to the proximal airwaves. Um, we've seen um, changes in mucosillary clearance um, that I think are, are quite concerning. And so, and this is something that we've just started studying in the lab. So it's too early to say. One thing I will say about vaping is that um, every single product is a little bit different. And what we've realized is that the main toxicity to the airway actually comes from the flavors. So there is some injury from the baseline aerosol mixtures and from the nicotine, but it's really the different flavors. And because there are thousands of different flavors, it makes it really challenging to study vaping. And of course, very difficult to regulate. And so the way my lab is addressing this is that we're actually building a high throughput aerosolized system we could actually test hundreds of different vapes at a time. Um, and in that way, um, I think this is really the only way we're gonna be able to tackle um, um, really um, what's going on with these different chemicals and the different flavors. So um, I, I, I am really suspicious that vaping and other um, inhaled products will cause injury to the airway that could possibly um, make COVID-19 worse, um, but we don't have any hard and fast data on that yet. Um, then the second question about the ACE2 receptor is also a great question. It's something that we did look at. Um, it has been published that smoking does increase ACE2 receptor expression, um, and this was in patients. Um, in our system, we actually started with cells that came from patients who were not smokers, and they were only exposed um, on four different occasions, so daily for four days and just for three minutes a day. And we did see a trend towards an increase in ACE2 expression, um, but it wasn't statistically significant. Um, but I am suspicious that if we do more, and especially if we smoke for longer, and possibly if we take cells from patients who are chronic smokers and then expose them further, um, that we will see that the, the virus does increase ACE2 expression. So that's a, a really important point. And now I'm blanking on the third question, sorry. The question is whether there's any difference between men and women. In oh yes, and that of course is, is another really important question. So we're really interested um, in looking at male versus female, a younger versus older age groups, and then different races and ethnicities. And we have all of these samples and we're busy doing that testing right now. Uh, again, it's too soon, we don't have the data yet because we have to do so many replicates of these um, to be able to conclusively say anything. Um, but I think these are all great, really great questions that our model can address. Okay. Uh, this is a question that goes to both uh, you and Sandra. And uh, the question is whether you think mechanical forces play a role in differentiation. You both mentioned the air-liquid interface as an induction factor. And the questioner was wondering whether mechanical for forces such as expansion and dilation may also play a role in, uh, in differentiation or maturation of your systems. Why don't you take it first, Sandra? Uh, 
So the answer is yes, and I have done these preliminary uh, studies using a system that actually plate cells in a six well uh, plate in a monolayer and then actually induces stretch. So the plates aren't a rigid plastic um, type of a material, but it's actually very flexible. And so what I've done is I've taken the um, organoids, plated them down as a monolayer, put them in the incubator, and then actually created a specific stretch um, computer design that mimics fetal lung breath movement. So it's only stretches every 45 seconds instead of the way that we're breathing, which is a lot faster. And so what we found is I looked at um, the expression of surfactant protein C, which is a surfactant protein that only alveolar type two cells make, which are the cells in the distal lung that secrete uh, this kind of soapy molecule that keeps our lungs open. And it is regulated um, when it comes to development. You could see surfactant appearing later on in a fetal development. And what I found was with the actual stretch of uh, mimicking the fetal breathing movements, I do see increased expression of the surfactant protein C. So absolutely, um, in utero, there's a reason a fetus breathes. It's not because they have air in their lungs. It's because they require that stretch in order to uh, develop their lungs. So. Yeah. Did you want to add anything, Bridget? Yes, so I, definitely biomechanical forces are critical for development and then obviously, you know, uh, in terms of how the cells respond to injury and repair. Uh, while there's a lot more, um, obviously, stretch that's happening in the more distal lung, in the alveolar sacs, in the more proximal airways, which are aligned by cartilaginous rings, um, there are areas of more stiff areas and then there are areas that, that are not as stiff. And um, we've seen that there are sort of these niche effects uh, where different regions of the airway are more important in supporting um, stem cell behavior than other regions. And so this is something that we're also trying to model in the lab with some bioengineering approaches is actually adding um, you know, cartilaginous rings to the aliquid interface cultures and in sort of an ALI 2.0 type model, if you will, uh, to try and replicate um, those, those um, biomechanical forces um, even if they may not, may not be as strong as stretch, um, they, they're, they're still very important in dictating how the cells behave. Okay. This next uh, question is for Karen. And the questioner was wondering whether you've ever seen blockage of vessels uh, with administration of your compound, your extracellular matrix compound, and do you consider that any kind of possible danger in your therapy? Yeah, so that's something we definitely looked at really closely because anytime you're injecting anything into the bloodstream and especially because this has the, the potential to gel. So we haven't seen blockage um, and we've actually, I didn't mention it um, in the talk, but we've actually done a lot of hemocompatibility studies as well. Um, it, even with the, the full hydrogel form, we have injected a lot into the bloodstream and never saw embolization anywhere. So, so far we have have no evidence of it and it doesn't affect clotting time. So um, it, it does actually shockingly look like it's hemocompatible even though it's extracellular matrix. And we think it's because of the digestion processing that we do that allows it to be that way. Great. Uh, this next question is both to Justin and to Sandra. And it was, uh, it was interesting that, uh, that Sandra in the drugs she was talking about was talking about the early entry point and Justin was talking about the late entry point. In fact, uh, uh, bo both of you used that same schematic that was uh, provided in a review article. Does that provide any suggestion that maybe there could be a synergistic use of drugs and that like most viruses like HIV and others that we're, we're actually gonna need cocktails of drugs hitting the viral life cycle at various points. And both of you suggested wonderful opportunities for doing that. I'll, I'll let you comment first, Justin. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, the, most, the most successful treatment is gonna be a combination of the, uh, the TMPRSS2 blockers and PIK5 inhibitors. Um, I think that uh, some people have done some studies recently looking at uh, how much SARS-CoV-2 uses both entry pathways, and um, it definitely uses both. Um, it's a little bit different from SARS-CoV-1, uh, the first SARS uh, in that respect, but um, certainly it also depends on how much, you know, TMPRSS2, the different cells in the lung or throughout the body are going to be expressing on the surface. 
Uh, so some cells will be very susceptible to the TNPRSS2 entry pathway, the early entry pathway, and others will be primarily utilizing the late entry pathway. So if we could get a cocktail um, that blocks both, I think that would be, that would show maximal efficacy. Absolutely. Did you want to comment, Sandra, as well? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with Justin. And what's also more important, um, along with that um, cocktail that targets both the early and late phase of viral entry, is a way to determine more in a patient-specific manner um, what kind of patients, whether it's gender or ethnicity related, have more of an effect of the early versus the late? Because like I said before, it's not a one size fits all model. You can't just do a clinical trial doing one medication and you know, have this big cure all. You really do have to tailor these cocktails to the actual type of biology that a person has inherent in their lung. And so I completely agree that the cocktail is important, but also we need to target, um, like um, uh, Justin said, like who has more tempers two cells, who has more cathepsin inhibition ability, um, which patient population has um, that viral entry that's more in the later phase. So uh, that's why it's very, very important to really target and um, utilize a therapy that's um, in a more patient specific manner. Great. Uh, the next question is for you, Justin. It's a little more specific. It's, uh, did, did it surprise you that nefamistat, which is a Tempris 2 inhibitor, did not seem to have uh, an effect in, in the system, in the data that you showed? Uh, no, I think that that particular experiment uh, was in cells that don't have a lot of TMPRSS2 on the surface. Okay. So th therefore, we actually expected um, very little um, effect, although we've done it We've now used it in other cells uh, uh, that uh, definitely have TMPRSS2, and it has a very strong effect in those cells. And in kind of um, in experimental proof of concept of what you were asking in the previous question, uh, we definitely see a synergistic effect when we combine the famistat and the PIK5 inhibitors. So, you know, you almost completely eliminate viral infection at that point. Okay. Yeah. Um, and this is a question to you, Sandra. Uh, it, it looked like in some of the data that you are presenting that, uh, well, certainly the virus hit uh, ACE2 receptors. There were clearly uh, cells that were ACE2 receptor negative that looked like they were infected. And conversely, not all the ACE2 receptor positive cells appear to be infected. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, yep, just like we had already discussed with that little picture both me and Justin showed that there is an only one way for the virus to enter and the ACE2 entry point is linked with TMPRSS2, which is a protease. And so if we're looking at non-protease entry points with a late phase entry points that a virus utilizes to get into the cell, that's definitely one hypothesis. And we're actually utilizing the pseudovirus with GFP, and we infected our organoids, and then we sorted them for GFP positive and GFP negative cells to determine, and then we're do, we uh, performed a single cell RNA-seq to determine um, in the cells that were infected with the GFP positive pseudovirus, are all those virus ACE2 expressing? We hypothesis that they're not. And then are we able to discover novel either receptor-based mechanisms for viral entry or maybe other targets on the cell surface that the virus uses to get inside. So you seem to be saying that um, if, if we're overly focused on just ACE2 receptors or Tempris2 and figure that's the only way that uh, the virus gets in, that we may be missing whole other routes of entry. Um, that may also explain why uh, the virus infects other organs where Tempris 2 is not as, uh, as abundant and maybe ACE2 receptors are not as abundant. Exactly. And even to kind of flip the point, um, the alveolar type 2 cells, which are again those cells in the distal lung that make the surfactant, they do express the ACE2 receptor, but at very minimal levels. And um, some data have actually shown that those that are expressing ACE2 
even those don't get infected. And so the question is, you have the receptor that the virus should be targeting, but you're not getting infected. So I think there's a lot more to the story than ACE2 is the lock and the key to get the virus inside the cell. This is a question, I guess, um, addressed to everybody. Um, and everybody in this particular session has been focusing on the lung. I, I guess the question is, we now know that uh, the virus has effects on other organs. We see other symptomatology, including uh, uh, in the gut, in the nervous system. How applicable do you think some of the insights you will be obtaining from the lung whether it be drugs or anti-inflammatory actions, might also apply to, uh, to some of these other organ systems. I guess, Justin, maybe, why don't you start off? Because you're a perfect example of a drug that you <laughs> never intended to be used for the lung. And do you think it could also address some of the nervous system issues? And then I'll open it up to the rest of the panel. Yeah, you know, I, we've been looking carefully through the literature to find evidence of direct infection of brain tissue. And it's actually not... I think the one place where it is clear, maybe, or nervous system tissue, uh, where, where it's clear is the olfactory um, sensory area. So I think those cells are getting infected um, by the by the virus, uh, although they don't get they don't get killed. So they seem to recover after uh, viral infection is subsides. But as for evidence of of direct infection of the brain, we actually I don't think a lot of people have seen that. Um, it seems like the effects on the brain may be mediated through effects, uh, systemic effects from the blood that then impact the brain. Um, so we, so I, I would say blocking it in other, in other areas of the body, not just the lung, but other uh, systems would probably be the best way of impacting uh, the health of the brain. Uh, but that, that's, that's, our, that's our current understanding. So Karen, you started out actually trying to uh, blunt inflammation in the heart. Presumably yours will also uh, blunt inflammation from the virus in the heart and perhaps other organs as well. Yeah, that's what we're thinking. So the models we're using, the LPS, and then we're also gonna start using that in combination with a mechanical ventilation injury, which more injures the lungs, but it also induces greater systemic inflammation. But yeah, we are particularly interested in the heart as a, <laughs> as a lab that has a heavy focus on the heart. Um, you know, there's more and more reports of cardiac inflammation. So we've already shown that it, it targets kind of that inflammatory area and helps dampen it in, a, in, a, in the case of a heart attack. So we are interested in looking at the heart, but we think so far we've actually seen it in multiple organs that are inflamed. So we do think it's the potential to kind of treat all areas of inflammation. So we're going to look at the lungs first, but then we're definitely going to look at those other organs. But presumably not the CNS. It probably doesn't make it through the blood-brain barrier, or does it? Unless it's compromised. Um, so we actually do have some data in a brain injury model that when you injure a traumatic brain injury, um, so for the brain, um, that it will like seal off that um, leaky vasculature too. So it, I think it, it all comes down to whether the vasculature is leaky in that area or not. If it is, I think we can target it. If it's not, I don't think we'll help. Okay. We only have two minutes left. Bridget, did you want to just comment on whether your insights apply to other organs as well? And then we'll finish up with Sandra. Yeah, I mean, we're obviously heavily focused on the lung, but my, my understanding is also that um, this is not a virus that seems to be infecting other areas. For example, the heart directly or even um, inflammatory cells directly. It's, it's still controversial as to whether, uh, for example, macrophages are directly um, infected or whether potentially we're seeing some of the virus inside macrophages just from phagocytosis. And so I think um, the major effects that we're seeing are probably inflammation based. And um, that, that of course is a challenge because then we're gonna need to be regulating um, you know, the immune system as well as just the, the epithelium. And, and right now, um, I, I think this came up in Sandra's talk as well, is that it's really important to study just not the epithelium alone in isolation, um, but also in the context of inflammatory cells too. Clearly there's gonna be a lot of crosstalk between those and um, we need to understand 
understand how, how the virus is, um, is working with, with both scenarios because ultimately we're gonna find a therapy. Um, yes, reducing infection and preventing infection is gonna be key, um, but once there's infection and there's already inflammation, then how are we gonna target that um, for those very, very sick patients? So I think um, overall it's, it's, it's a big challenge. Sanja, did you wanna add anything? Uh, yeah, sure, just quickly. Um, we do think that um, the endodermal organ, so the endoderm is just one of the germ layers from um, embryonic stem cells. Um, and those are the lung, the gut, just like you already brought up, those we have shown, uh, not personally, but the literature, the investigators have shown that they get infected. And we think um, clinically, that's all the first phase is the viral infection. The second phase of this disease is the immunological response. And that's usually the second week. Uh, if you look at clinical uh, papers, and that's when the immune system either over responds or appropriately responds, and they can actually hurt the uh, uh, patient as well, not the virus itself. And then the third kind of phase of the infection is this hypercoagulable or kind of pro-clotting um, aspect of the disease. And that's when you actually see the other manifestations in the heart and the brain, like a stroke or, you know, I don't know if like specific heart attacks, but definitely uh, ischemia or lack of oxygen to the heart. Um, that um, clinicians see in that kind of third phase of um, the virus infection. So it's probably not a direct effect of the virus, but an indirect effect of the actual body itself dealing with uh, trying to get rid of the virus. Okay, I think with that, uh, we'll probably draw this session to a close. I think what does come away is how much, just within the four panelists here, how much collaborative work could actually be done pooling our resources, and, and hopefully this is something that CIRM will be able to catalyze because we have so many common insights and complementary tools. Um, and with that, I thank everybody for listening, and I thank the participants for sharing their great research. <music>